So now that everybody knows how Alzheimer's works, everybody's seen under the hood, um, which is a good thing to know because now you can kind of decide, you can see how to prevent and reverse cognitive decline. So now we're gonna talk about the nuts and bolts. What do you actually do? What are the different subtypes? And what are the, what are the, the uh, what is in your armamentarium? What are the arrows in your quiver? What's really interesting is I was always told as a neurologist, there's nothing you can do about this. Write a prescription for Aricept. It's terminal illness, forget it. Uh, and as you'll see, in fact, the armamentarium for this problem is absolutely huge. There is a tremendous amount that can be done. And learning about what are the critical things to do and what are the critical things to avoid is actually really important. Okay, so oops, here we go. So subtyping, so why do we do this? Um, first of all, when we started to look at what was actually driving this, and again, you know, I have to say, uh, you know, as a classically trained scientist and neurologist, I had no, I didn't even know what functional medicine was. I had no idea about this whole field. So we just came straight out of the test tube. This is what's driving the biochemistry of this thing we call Alzheimer's. So maybe we can do something about those things. Luckily for us, it turned out there's already a field here, functional medicine, integrative medicine, that is all about doing that. And it actually makes so much sense. So I, that's one of the reasons I'm so convinced that functional medicine is the right way to go, because the science tells me. So I was so surprised to see that when we went from what our results over 30 years had shown and said, aha, this is the way you should attack this in a human being to translate this, and people said, oh, that's called alternative medicine. Like, no, I, no, that's no alternative medicine, <laughs> because there isn't an alternative, right? And when you actually look at this disease. So it's, it's interesting to me that classical medicine is actually doing it the way that makes no sense for the biochemistry of the disease. So when you start to look at all the things that are actually upstream, that are causing this problem, what you see is that people tend to group in these different groups. So there are dozens of potential contributors, as I mentioned. Optimal treatment depends on addressing the, up, you know, the upstream mechanisms. Of course, that only makes sense. And the surprise to me is that people have been treating this disease without asking what's causing it. I mean, that really makes no sense. So <clears throat> if you look at the actual signaling of APP that we just looked at, what puts it on the good side, what puts it on the bad side, it's affected by dozens of things. I mentioned earlier, NF-kappa-V is one of them. Estradiol is another one. Vitamin D is another one. Thyroid hormone is another one. Brain-derived neurotrophic factor is another one. These things are all, are all impinging and impacting that particular molecular pathway. Therefore, we want to look at these things. We want to look at contributors to inflammation, to glycotoxicity, to trophic loss, to toxicity, to vascular compromise, and trauma. Most people have contributions. Typically, we find 10 to 25 different factors. We haven't seen a single person yet who has any cognitive decline where it was just due to one thing. So we want to look at multiple things. Now, there may be priorities. There may be some where it's mostly one thing. But we've never found a single person that has just one. So step one, when you are going to to determine what's going on here. First, we want to know, where do you stand? Are you pre-symptomatic? Do you have SCI, MCI, or Alzheimer's? So you really have these four stages. Stage one is you're asymptomatic. You don't have symptoms, but you already have the pathophysiology going on. We know from studies of spinal fluid and studies of PET scans that it takes about 20 years from the beginning of the changes of Alzheimer's to when you get a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. So that gives us a big window to treat. And there are a lot of people out there who are asymptomatic who are already undergoing these early changes, which is why we recommend the cognoscopy that we heard about early. Everybody knows when you turn 50, you should get a colonoscopy, right? Okay, in fact, when, when, when my wife and I uh, first did that, we actually went on Valentine's Day and got his and hers colonoscopies so we could celebrate together afterwards. Um, we were both very happy to hear that things were all good. So when you turn 45 or more, you should get a cognoscopy, and it's a series of blood tests, and you should also get an online cognitive assessment. It's easy to do, and it can really save your life. So that's stage one, pre-symptomatic. 
Stage two, if you don't do anything about that, then you advance to what's called SCI, subjective cognitive impairment. You know there's something wrong. Often your spouse may know there's something wrong, but if you go in to get evaluated, they'll tell you, oh, you're still, you are still scoring in the normal range. Now you have to be careful about that. That's partly based on the tests. If the tests aren't all that sensitive, you're gonna score in the normal range until fairly late in the process. So when you know there's something wrong, and we always find people generally know they're usually correct. When they think there's something wrong, they're usually right. And, and often people who come in for prevention are already into SCI or even early MCI. And we had one woman came in a few years ago who said, you know, it's a strong family history. I'm in my late 40s. I just want to check things out. Well, she ended up having a MOCA score of 23. So she already was well into mild cognitive impairment or MCI. And thankfully, and she had APOE4. Thankfully, now she's now got, just wrote to me recently, she's got a score of 30, which is perfect. She's doing great. So you don't want to wait again. Now, if you then, by the way, SCI typically lasts about 10 years. So you have a real window early on to reverse this process. If you don't, you then typically go on to MCI, which is mild cognitive impairment. And by definition, what that means is, now not only do you know there's something wrong, but in fact, when you take tests, the tests are abnormal. But you don't have Alzheimer's until you actually begin to lose your activities of daily living. So as long as you're caring for yourself and you're doing your activities of daily living, then by definition, you don't have full-blown Alzheimer's. But you can see, again, when someone has Alzheimer's, that's the end stage. This is like saying widely metastatic cancer. This is something that's been going on for years and years and years. So we should never be waiting until full-blown Alzheimer's to get treatment. Okay, so we talked about SCI, uh, and I didn't mention the math champion. We had a guy who had fairly late stage Alzheimer's disease, and his wife took him in, and the, uh, the neuropsychologist said, oh, you've scored in the 50th percentile, everything's fine. And she said, are you crazy? This guy was a genius. And so that's where you know, the testing can be a problem. So as I say, it converts to MCI when the tests become abnormal. About five to 10% of people with MCI convert to full-blown Alzheimer's each year and it occurs when activities of daily living change. Okay, so we wanna determine then the subtypes. First of all, it's very helpful to know whether the person started out with an amnestic presentation. Typical story with Alzheimer's, people have trouble learning new things. And someone said to me once, well, how does the biochemistry tell you why would it be memory is so important? Well, in fact, your brain does this as a program. Why does it do this? Well, okay, let me ask you, if you could wake up tomorrow morning and either you're going to forget how to drive, how to do your job, how to speak, how to interact with people, or you're gonna forget the Friends rerun from tonight, you know, what would you choose? Exactly, and so your brain essentially is doing that. When the first thing that goes, just as in your company, when things aren't going well, the first thing you say is don't hire anybody new. And that's what happens. Your brain is very good. You've remembered things for your whole life. You still remember how to drive. You still remember how to speak. You still remember all these things. You just can't learn anything new. And that's a, often an early harbinger for Alzheimer's disease. So you wanna get, in, get that taken care of as early as possible. That's the common presentation. The less common presentation, about a third of patients, don't have memory problems initially, but they have problems with executive, so-called executive dysfunction. They have problems with organizing. They often have problems with making a tip and doing calculations. They often have problems with word finding. Um, they, will, they can come in with aphasia, so-called primary progressive aphasia. They can have problems with visual recognition. That's a different kind of Alzheimer's disease. It's helpful to know which one the person started. Now, of course, ultimately, you have all those things, but it's helpful to know how it started. There are several different metabolic syndromes that we call Alzheimer's disease. So what we call type one is inflammatory. As you saw that guy that had the high HSCRP. There is atrophic, that's a different story. And again, if you think about it, 
you can either lose a system because you're taxing it too much with inflammation or because you're not supporting it well enough with trophic factors. Either way, you're on the wrong side of the balance. So there are people where you have a more atrophic presentation. What was really interesting, after we first described these, we found that in the Ayurvedic literature from thousands of years ago, they had said the same thing. So we were a few thousand years too late on that one. Uh, we weren't the first to describe this, but they saw the same thing. Of course, they didn't call it Alzheimer's disease, but they talked about people who had dementia and had people who more had an atrophic look or more had an inflammatory look. And then we call this type 1.5 glycotoxic or sweet, and it's very common because it does, it's like the worst of both worlds. So on the one hand, you're eating too much sugar, and a, a lot of Alzheimer's disease, by the way, is that we're living in a way that our bodies were not designed to live. We were not designed to eat a bunch of sugar. It just doesn't work, unfortunately. So when we do that, what happens? On the one hand, you actually get non-enzymatic glycation. The sugar molecules stick to all sorts of different proteins. Now, we measure it as hemoglobin A1C, of course, but there are hundreds of other proteins that are glycated. It's like remoras on a shark. So you got all these things sticking on there. And what happens? The shark doesn't work as well, right? And the other thing is your immune system recognizes this as a change in shape. So you get the inflammation of type 1 Alzheimer's but also you get insulin resistance. Your insulin receptor with a molecule called IRS1, which is a downstream signaler of the insulin receptor, phosphorylates itself to turn down its response. Literally, you've got so much insulin for so long that your body is, has, is having to turn down the response. That is how you get insulin resistance. And when you measure that insulin resistance in the brain, virtually everybody with Alzheimer's disease, whether they have it peripherally or not, has insulin resistance, that signature, that biochemical signature of insulin resistance. So bad news for type 1 and type 2, which is why we call it type 1.5. Type 3, toxic. This is a fundamentally different problem. These are typically the people that present with that non-amnestic syndrome. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then type 4, vascular. Uh, definitely uh, vessels contribute to Alzheimer's disease. And then finally, traumatic. So if you've had a head injury, you're at increased risk. So let's talk about these different types. Type 1, inflammatory. You have an increase in your HSCRP, no surprise. You have a reduction in your albumin to globulin ratio. Your albumin is the most important molecule to ferry out the amyloid. And by the way, you don't want to get rid of your amyloid until you get rid of the thing that's causing your amyloid. But once you do, you do want to get rid of your amyloid. So you want to reduce that over time. So no surprise, the drugs that went in there and pulled out the amyloid without doing anything else didn't work because you've got to get rid of what's causing the amyloid. These people also have an increase. If you look at what's called M1 to M2 ratio, they're macrophages. You're looking, you simply take their peripheral monocytes and you're looking at these things for whether they are a type that's pro-inflammatory or a type that resolves inflammation. And no surprise, these people have high amounts of the ones that are pro-inflammatory. Interestingly, there's a professor at UCLA, Milan Fiala, who developed a really interesting test a number of years ago called, he called it the MFI. It's a phagocytosis index. All he does is he takes some blood cells from you and he looks to see, are your blood cells able to gobble up amyloid? And the big surprise is everybody with Alzheimer's does not gobble up amyloid very well. And they have these low indices and everybody who doesn't have it gobbles it up very well. And what it turned out is very interesting. These are people that are inflamed typically and therefore they're sending signals you know, don't take away the amyloid. It's helping me fight these various infectious things. It's an antimicrobial peptide. So you're not wanting to take it up. So we've had a number of people on our program now look at this, and they're, no surprise, their indices go way up when they go on the program. When they go off it, they go back down again. 
ApoE4, common risk factor for this group. These people typically come in with an amnestic presentation. They often have hippocampal atrophy, as like the guy you saw there. So we want to find the cause of the inflammation. Is it because they have a leaky gut? Is it because they have advanced glycation end products? Is it their diet? Is it poor oral hygiene? We want to seek the cause of that. And then we want to determine the drivers and prioritize those. For the inflammatory guys, what's causing it? We want to know. We want to use, initially, we want to use these pro-resolving mediators, and you can get the same effect with high doses of omega-3s. And then we want to use anti-inflammatories such as omega-3s, ginger, pregnenolone, if you have suboptimal levels, which is common, curcumin. There are lots of ways to go after inflammation. But of course, you also want to get rid of the cause of it. And then we use a specific diet, uh, which is called Ketoflex 12-3. But you can use other diets. The whole point is you are driving a biochemistry toward mild ketosis, which turns out to give you appropriate fuel for your brain. You want to have an appropriate fasting period from 12 to 16 hours at night, and at least three hours before you go to bed. So in fact, what we were taught in medical school is that when you treat someone for a disease, you know, the diet really doesn't make that much difference. It makes a huge difference. And you know, they shouldn't have taught us that. So you want to achieve mild ketosis. And if you are measuring your ketone levels, you want to be somewhere 0.5 to 5 millimolar beta hydroxybutyrate. The people that do the best seem to be in that one to to four range. So you want to get it up. And initially, you may have trouble producing ketones, especially if you don't have some body fat there. So you can take some exogenous ketones. Fine. In the long run, you'd prefer to have endogenous instead of exogenous ketosis. But if you have nothing, as you can imagine, you don't have the glucose and you don't have the ketones, what happens? You feel like, oh my gosh, I have no energy. We hear this all the time. So you got to get your ketone level up a little bit. And it takes a couple of weeks to get really keto adapted. Um, this is a flexitarian approach. If you want to be a vegetarian, no problem. You want to eat some meat and fish, no problem. Uh, and by the way, I should mention, you know, many, many people in the US, choline deficient. So don't forget eggs, nice pastured eggs. Um, not the non-pastured eggs. We want to achieve metabolic flexibility so that you can burn glucose when you want to, and you can burn fats when you want to. We want to heal the gut. Use probiotics and prebiotics. If you're ApoE4 positive, because you actually are a better fat absorber, you want to go a little longer, 14 to 16 hours. And there's a wonderful website you may be aware of if you're ApoE4 positive, which is apoe4.info. Um, there are 3,500 ApoE4 uh, people on there. Julie G, who started this, is a woman who's 4'4", um, who's working with me actually on the next book. Uh, and she, um, is, she actually went on the program, went from 35th percentile on her cognitive testing to 98th percentile. Um, she's written her story, a beautiful story of her improvement after she literally had moved home to die because she was told she was APOE 4, 4 po and positive and uh, not doing well overall. OK. Um, so. Exercise turns out to be incredibly helpful. You want to have both strength training and cardiovascular. If you like HIT, that's great. But this improves a number of parameters. It improves your insulin sensitivity, by the way. It improves your vascularization, improves your oxygenation, improves your, your ketosis and your brain-derived neurotrophic factor. The ketones are interesting. They actually cross the blood-brain barrier. They actually go into the nucleus, just the way I was showing you that APOE4 does. They actually at, interact with specific histones and pull these away and allow you to make more BDNF. So in fact, this really helps. OK, do you have sleep apnea? This is one of the most important things. Everybody should find out what their nocturnal oximetry is. We had a guy recently, his doctors had never bothered to check, and he was having all sorts of problems. This guy was, every night when he goes to sleep, his oxygen saturation, which should be 96 to 98% when you're sleeping, his dropped to 71%. Um, just an absolute mess. And of course, fixing that was really, really helpful for him. Sleep hygiene, all these things, critical. Stress, again, as a scientist, if you'd told me I'd be talking to people about joy and stress and love and all this stuff, you know, 15 years ago, I would have laughed. I thought this stuff was so ridiculous. And it turns out to be so incredibly important. 
You cannot argue with the data. And in fact, interestingly, when we were developing uh, drugs for Alzheimer's disease, one of the things that we found is specific, the, the receptor that your brain uses when it is going to make cortisol, which is the CRH receptor, um, this thing actually turns out to have a pro-Alzheimer's effect. So one of the drugs that we were developing actually prevents you from activating that, that stress-related receptor. When you have increase in cortisol, what happens to your hippocampus? Robert Sapolsky showed it shrinks. So these things are absolutely critical. And actually, meditation, again, something I didn't used to believe in, turns out to be really helpful. Brain training. Uh, so Professor, Professor Mike Mersnick um, is the originator of brain training. Um, they have uh, very good results. As you know, there's been controversy about it. And I think part of the controversy and part of the reason for it is because they did it many times without optimizing the biochemistry. So if you're going to try to do, it's like, it's like if you're going to lift weights, but you have terrible nutrition, the weights are not going to do the same as if you lift the weights when you do everything else right. And then there are all sorts of supplements that people say, oh, supplements don't help your brain. No, they actually change the biochemistry. If you know the right ones to use in the right situations, they can be incredibly powerful. So nicotinamide riboside increases NAD, magnesium 3 and 8. I mean, there's stuff published on all these things. Resveratrol, again, something I didn't used to believe in until we actually studied it in the lab. Um, it has a very interesting impact. When you have ApoE4, by the way, I mentioned it actually binds to 1,700 genes and turns them down. One of the genes it binds to is SIRT1, which is a longevity and anti-Alzheimer gene. So the ApoE4, unfortunately, is actually turning that down. Well, things like resveratrol actually help that get activated. Pregnenolone, so many of us are low in pregnenolone. Find out your pregnenolone, helpful to know. Vitamin D, again, many of us uh, are deficient in vitamin D. Citicoline helps for cholinergic neurotransmission, which is important for memory formation. DHA, on and on and on. Beautiful work out of MIT from Professor Wertman over the last 25 years showing the requirement for both DHA, which is one of the omega-3s, uh, and citicoline in synapse formation. So all these things, very, very helpful. And then herbs, and be careful about the sourcing of the herbs. You want to get them from the right places. Um, there are places like Banyan that are quite good, Gaia, very good, um, Metagenics, another good one, Natura, another good one, and others, but be careful. There's a lot of junk out there. Bacopa monieri, been used for thousands of years. Um, Withania somnifera, which is basically ashwagandha, very helpful as well. Um, turmeric, people have heard so much about because it has this beautiful anti-inflammatory effect. And by the way, turmeric binds very tightly to amyloid beta and helps you to remove that, again, at appropriate times. And on and on for other things as well. And then your immune status. People with Alzheimer's have a really interesting immune paradox. On the one hand, their innate immune system, that's the evolutionarily older part of the immune system, is on high alert. It's activating. You've got this chronic inflammation. On the other hand, their adaptive systems are not up to snuff. And you can measure, for example, your cellular system using a test called Immuno, which measures your CD4 cells. And often you'll find that they're very low. There seems to be a problem with with, with phagocytosis and the antigen presentation, which is what links these two systems. So instead of looking like this, where you get a problem, they hand it off to the adaptive system, they take care of it, and all's good, you this chronic activation with ongoing inflammation for years, damaging your brain, and you're never able to get it together to get rid of this. Now, why would that happen? Genetics, one reason. What you're eating is another reason. But interestingly, one of the common ones is we get exposure to molds, and what do they molds do? They make immunosuppressants. The reason they make those is because they can't live inside you. Your immune system is too good to allow molds to live in your sinuses or your gut, et cetera, unless they suppress your immune system. And we see this all the time with people with very high levels of these immunosuppressants from the molds. And so we want to get their immune system back up to normal, and there are all sorts of things you can do to do that in addition to standard diet, exercise, et cetera. Um, Tinospora is one that's been used for thousands of years. It supports your immune system. 
Um, thymus and alpha-1 is another one. Low-dose naltrexone is another one. Uh, there are all sorts of things that are actually quite helpful for this. Okay, then after you resolve the inflammation, consider whole coffee fruit extract. Anyone ever use whole coffee fruit extract? So this is something that increases your brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Um, there's another one, which is 7-8-dihydroxyflavone, uh, which it actually interacts with the receptor for BDNF. So another thing to think about. And so you want to optimize all the suboptimal values. Um, if you have a lot of vascular component, consider hyperbaric oxygen, or what I like even better is called EWOT. Who, anyone use EWOT? Yeah, great, okay. So this is exercise with oxygen training. You literally jump on a bike for 15 or 20 minutes and do with 100% oxygen, and it actually supports the brain, supports, by the way, the macula as well and other areas. So um, follow up, you know, a few months later, um, as the metabolism goes, so goes the cognition. If your metabolism is horrible, your cognition doesn't tend to get better. Use a health coach. They can be very, very helpful. It's critical to remove the cause. If the decline continues, something's wrong. Something you've, you've missed something or you haven't, uh, you haven't addressed something. One warning, the one thing that can come up that can be a problem, it's rare. How many people here have dealt with congophilic angiopathy? Okay, so not common, but think about it especially in males who are APOE44, who have a family history of hemorrhagic stroke. That's the big triad. That should send bells, you know, send, send a, an alarm into your head to say, wait a minute, be careful. These people can have a cerebral hemorrhage, and so you want to avoid giving them high doses of omega-3s and anything else that could potentially uh, prevent blood clotting. That's a problem. Again, rare. Okay, type two, very different. These are the people that just don't support their brains enough. They tend to be older. The type one guys are typically 60, you know, in their 60s. It's kind of typical. The type two people are typically in their 70s, and the type three people are typically in their 50s. Not always, but that's the kind of the typical time. So they tend to be a little older. They typically are amnestic. They often will tell you, no, I, I feel fine. I just, and then their spouse will say, yeah, but they can't remember anything. And it's because they're not inflamed. They just don't have enough support. They don't have enough estradiol, testosterone, progesterone, vitamin D, pregnenolone, thyroid, and so forth. They just can't support that nervous network, that nervous system network. They're often APOE4 positive. Rapid reductions in support are most concerning. So if you have a sudden drop off, the people who are at greatest uh, risk for this are people who had an early oophorectomy with no hormone replacement because suddenly they dropped with their supportive hormones, unfortunately. Hippocampal atrophy common. So remember with these, you gotta be careful about a couple things. One is this controversy. So how many people use bioidentical hormone replacement? Yeah, a number of people. Okay, so good thing, yeah, thank you. So good thing uh, to know about, there is a controversy. Um, on the other hand, many people have said to me, I'd rather deal with potential risk down the road, um, but improve my cognition now. I'd rather, uh, you know, I'd rather have the concern down the road than to continue to go downhill now. So it's, it's a person by person discussion. So here's a typical story. 75-year-old psychiatrist, severe difficulty, just could not remember. And in fact, her significant other said, your memory is disastrous. No problems with organizing, calculating, dressing, or speaking. So typical amnestic presentation. She's an APOE 3.3. Um, she had a pet compatible with Alzheimer. Her MRI, hippocampal volume, 16th percentile. Online cognitive assessment, 9th percentile for her age. Low vitamin D, pregnenolone, progesterone, estradiol, free T3, B12, all of those. So she had type 2 MCI. And she begins the protocol. Initially, she left out a few things. Her cognitive assessment over time went from 9th percentile to 97th percentile. Her significant other said it went from disastrous to just plain lousy. And then later he said, now it's normal. He said, I liked you better before because now you're a little too sharp. Um, and she just noticed a marked improvement in her memory, and she improved all of her metabolic uh, parameters. She's continuing to optimize this. Her hippocampal volume is now 62nd percentile. Okay, so 
key. We want to optimize. It's pretty basic. We want to optimize all these different things. Um, you may need to use a bioidentical hormone replacement, thyroid, pregnenolone, vitamin D. You want to optimize, not just get to the low end of normal, but optimize these different things. Um, as I mentioned, there's a controversy about bioidentical hormone. You may want to refer them to a bioidentical hormone uh, expert. Whole coffee fruit extract may be particularly helpful in these people because you increase your BDNF. Be careful with fasting. Make sure they have enough trophic support because um, if people, especially the ones who are very thin with fasting, they may not be able to generate the ketones and may not do as well. Synaptogenesis, citicoline, and DHA, as Professor Wortman has shown. Interestingly, there may be a role for secreta dogs. Does anyone use secreta dogs here, like serovital or things like that? So in general, people don't use these, and there has been a monotherapeutic trial of growth factor, this human growth hormone, uh, years ago, and it, of course, one thing didn't do much. Um, but th these, this would be the sort of person where it may make the most sense. You want to restore insulin sensitivity. If that's an issue, do they have sufficient insulin? So when someone comes in and I look at their fasting insulin, which should be four or five, I feel better when I see 25, okay, they've got insulin resistance, we're gonna be able to fix them. The ones that I worry about are the ones that come in at one. Because they're just not, especially if they come in at one and their hemoglobin A1C is six, they have prediabetes and they're just not able to make the insulin. So those, you may end up having to support. Now what happens is as they get better, they're able to make more of their own insulin. And how many people here have used continuous glucose monitor like a, uh, freestyle Libre or one of those things. One or two people, yeah. Incredibly helpful. It tells you what's spiking your glucose and it tells you what is driving it down. And I really worry about some of these people where they're driving, their, they're getting hypoglycemic at night. That is likely to be a damaging problem that they're not even aware of. And we've seen this picked up in a number of people now who had these continuous glucose monitors. So just as it's helpful to know your nocturnal ox oximetry, it's also to helpful to know your continuous glucose monitoring. Okay, so type 1.5, you can pretty much predict everything. These are the people that have the inflammatory piece from the glycation products, but they also have the atrophic part from the insulin resistance. I mentioned Professor Getzel noted that 100% of these people had insulin resistance. ApoE4, important factor. Amnestic presentation, common. Be careful, you gotta be careful about over, if you, if, if you do give them insulin, uh, making sure there's not too much. And I think most people here don't do that, but there's actually a trial where they're trying to give everybody with Alzheimer's intranasal insulin and kind of flooding the system. So here's a typical story, three year history, poor memory and orientation. This guy's fasting insulin was 14, hemoglobin A1C 5.8, CRP 0.1. BMI was 33, normal, other things. So this guy has type 1.5 AD. So we want to restore insulin sensitivity to these people. These people do very well. There are, again, lots of things you can do. If you do the diet, exercise, sleep, stress, and of course many of them, sleep apnea really contributes to this. Stress really contributes to it. You can use other things like berberine, but just getting them on the right diet, exercise, sleep, stress, these people tend to do very well. Be careful, metformin is fine, but be careful it does increase the production of A-beta. Lots of things, berberine, cinnamon, alpha lipoic acid, on and on and on that can be very helpful for this. This is truly, for most of these people, self-inflicted cognitive decline. And if you have pure type 1.5 prognosis, is, it was very good. So here's a letter from a pastor who just received recently. He says, I have my wife back, my children and grandchildren have their mother and grandmother back. If you would have told me in October of last year that she'd be driving a car, singing in the choir, cooking dinner, going to Walmart, teaching Bible study, I would never have believed it could happen, but it did. So type three is the tough one. This is a field unto itself. About 15 or 20% of the patients have pure type three. These are the, typically the non-amnestics, but it contributes in over 50% of people. It's truly a hidden epidemic. We didn't see this when I was training. And so I think what's happened is this has been on the increase and it's been hidden under the umbrella of Alzheimer's. So I asked a number of my fellow neurology residents uh, trained with me way back in the 80s and said, did we see people in their 50s getting Alzheimer's? 
No, we just didn't see it. Now, unless they were the rare familial Alzheimer's disease, APP mutations, presenilin-1 mutations. But other than that, we just didn't see it. Now we see it all the time. And it's a typical story is it's usually women. Unfortunately, this is, as Maria Shriver says, a woman-centric disease. About two-thirds of all Alzheimer's patients are women, and about 60% of caregivers, unfortunately, are women. But especially in this type 3, it happens around the time of menopause, give or take a few years. There is this change. As you know, you are dropping the estradiol and the progesterone. And it may be that with this change, with the uh, osteoblastic to osteoclastic ratio, you may be releasing some of these toxins that you are sequestering over years in your bones. When you're exposed to these toxins, you're doing everything possible. You're excreting them, you're binding them, you're sequestering them all over your body, and so they may come out later. Uh, Chris Shade, who started Quicksilver, uh, suggests another possibility that your progesterone is dropping, and that is an important part of your detox pathways. So you want to know things like, what's your status with glutathione? You want to know what your, what your detox pathways are doing. So I really do think this is a hidden epidemic. We hear about it all the time now. I estimated in the first paper I wrote about this that there were at least 500,000 Americans. I'm convinced it's a lot more than that. That was a conservative estimate. We really ultimately need inpatient facilities, and there are a few groups that have talked about setting this up, so I'm very excited about that possibility. We need to get them out of the toxic environment for a few weeks. Where did it come from? I don't know, but we are seeing more and more of it. It may be because of more exposure uh, to these various toxins, but why there seems to be more exposure now, do not know. This is something where you need all hands on deck. You need people who are experienced with detox. You need people who understand the immunology here, that because you have these immunosuppressants on board, you need the, gene the uh, genetics to know what's functioning. Do you have null alleles at some of things like your glutathione peroxidase? Very important. Endocrinology because of the VHRT. Health coach to get you on what's a complicated approach. Uh, there is this seven-year, approximately, osteoclastic burst that occurs around the time of menopause, and that may be one of the reasons these people are presenting. Don't know. Um, many toxins, similar syndromes, this non-amnestic Alzheimer's. So it argues that it's something about the detox itself as opposed to toxin-specific effects. So these people are young. We typically see them in their early to mid-50s. We've seen a few later than that, but that's typical. They're often APOE4 negative. If they're APOE4 positive, they often have an amnestic component to their presentation. Tip, often they have negative family history. They often, interestingly, have low triglycerides and or zinc. They often have dysfunction of their hypothalamic pituitary axis. They often present with depression. When you hear 52-year-old woman with depression who seems to be demented, what's going on? That's type 3 Alzheimer's disease. And we see it again and again and again. And they're often treated for depression. And then the doctors take a while to realize, wait a minute, this is not just depression. They're becoming demented. They have problems, they'll often say, have trouble calculating tips. Uh, facial recognition, word finding. Essentially, this is a biparietal syndrome. These are all people, are all exposed to toxins. So look for them. They can be metallotoxins, like mercury. They can be organic toxins. One of the people that came in had a presentation that was visual perception, so she has PCA, posterior cortical atrophy, and she had been in the World Trade Center cloud. And that became very clear when she then developed a World Trade Center-associated cancer, unfortunately. So she had very high exposure to the various things in the World Trade Center, such as, uh, such as benzene, for example, which was one of the big things. That was one of the most toxic clouds in history. And by the way, um, almost 13% of the people who were in that cloud um, developed early dementia by 2015. This was a, an e epidemiological study from a group in New York. So incredibly toxic cloud, unfortunately. Um, and then the third thing I should say is biotoxins. So it's metals and other inorganics, organics, and biotoxins, typically mycotoxins. So look for those. These people are exquisitely sensitive to stress. We hear this all the time. 
This is atypical Alzheimer's common. So they have high C4As, high TGF beta 1s. They have high urinary mycotoxins frequently. They have multiply antibiotic resistant coag negative staph, visual contrast sensitivity abnormalities. Most of them, interestingly, don't have the allergic symptoms that Dr. Shoemaker described. So as he told me, yeah, these people don't quite have SIRS, but they do have the laboratory tests compatible with SIRS. OK, interestingly, here's Parkinson's over here. Type 1 and type 2 Alzheimer's are similar in many ways, even though they're different cause. Type 3 Alzheimer's is actually more similar to Lewy body disease and Parkinson's than it is to these others. So it is a toxin-related problem. It is the most difficult type of Alzheimer's to treat. You really got to stick with it. You really got to detox them. There's a wonderful book that you may have seen from Dr. Neil Nathan that's called Toxic Heal Your Body. And there's a wonderful, that's better on biotoxins. There's a wonderful chemotoxin book, which is called The Toxin Solution by Joseph Pizzorno. Both excellent books. So here's a case woman uh, presented with depression after a hysterectomy over the next four years. She developed problems with word finding, disorientation, recipes, driving, etc. Marked problems with stress. Neuropsych testing showed poor semantic fluency, etc. Reduced glucose utilization compatible with Alzheimer's. She went to a university dementia center. They started her on antidepressant and Aricept. She's an APOE 3.3. She had a high C4A, although not terribly high. Um, huge antithyroglobulin antibodies due to a leaky gut. So she had intranasal VIP. She was treated with detox. She improved in her memory, her interaction, following directions. Her MOCA score went up. Her husband wrote to me and said, they got into the car. And he said, oh, I forgot the directions. I'm not sure how to get to this place. And she said, oh, yeah, you just go. It's 15 miles from here. You go right, left, 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 right, right. And he just turned and looked at her and said, you haven't been able to do that in years. Now, what happened to her was, her son made the college football team at a big college far away. So her husband is an attorney who works late on Fridays. They would get an overnight flight, stay up all night getting to the game, see the game. Then he has to rush back for work, so they now have to rush back. Tremendous stress every weekend. What do you think happened to her? Right back down again. So she went down markedly. He had to realize, wait a minute, you can't, you can't treat someone like this when they are trying to be true, when you're trying to treat them for type 3 Alzheimer's. Everything was re-optimized. She improved again. So here's a woman, 67, amyloid PET positive, APOE4 positive, MOCA was 24, so she had MCI. Onset with depression. All right. Um, how are we doing on time here? Five? OK, good. All right. So. Non-amnestic presentation, uh, executive dysfunction. She had an extremely low zinc, extremely low triglycerides, high copper zinc ratio. She actually started with a drug company and went on anti-amyloid therapy. And each time she got the anti-amyloid antibody, she actually got worse. And we've heard this a number of times. Because something's still you know, bothering her, she's not getting rid of that. So she was smart enough after four times going downhill, she said, that's it, I'm not doing this again. So that's when I got the email. Um, and so I worked with her physician. We got her on a detox, got her on the right things. Her MOCA went from 24 to 30. This is perfect. She's doing absolutely great. Uh, she actually wrote a chapter for this next book about her story, and what happened with her. OK, so this is the tough one. And work with people who are doing They Work with experts who are doing detox, uh, people who are doing biotoxins or chemotoxins or whatever you identify in these people. Um, use consulting experts as you need them. We use the same sort of diet. When these people get ketotic, they do better. When they exercise, they do better. When their stress is low, they do better. When their biochemistry is fixed, when their glutathione's are optimal, they do better. Don't let them lose sleep. Uh, they, do, they do much better if they have DHRT. And some people do much better with IV glutathione. Um, some people do very well with cholestyramine or other binders. So you want to decide what's going on, what things are critical, and then use those. For people who have very low zinc, we use Professor Brewer's protocol, which is this combination of zinc picolinate, alpha lipoic acid, B6, small amount of manganese, and some vitamin C, um, which is often very helpful. 
Um, if they have Marcons, you want to treat the Marcons. You can do it with biocidin or beg spray. There are a no number of ways to do it. If they have mercury, that's actually, I'm happy when I see the ones with mercury. Those are easier to treat than the ones with, with mycotoxins. So you want to get rid of these. And you know the sicker, quicker phenomenon. If you get rid of mycotoxins and then you re-expose them, they get worse. So you really have to keep them out of the places uh, that have this. Many basics for, you know, there's basic detoxification. Um, IR saunas with, followed by non-emollient soaps, very helpful, increasing urine output with filtered water. Some people like coffee enemas, lemon water. All these things are just very basic detox. Some people like to use massage for lymphatic drainage. I know uh, Professor Nathan likes to do that. Herbal teas, zeolite, there are all these ways to do this. And then targeting the things that are actually causing the degeneration. And then you need to build things back up, obviously. And so after you start detoxing, you can use things like whole coffee fruit extract. Um, be patient. It's going to take some time. And this is, you know, you want to keep people on detox for years because you've got to remember this has been in their organs for likely for decades. Keep tweaking, keep evaluating their status. It's tough because of compliance. It's, com it's complex. Critical to keep these people optimized. If they regress, Look for whether they've gotten re-exposed because of this sicker, quicker phenomenon. And then type 4 is vascular. Treat this mostly like type 1. These people mostly have inflammation. Treat it like cardiovascular disease. You want to reduce their LDL particle number. Avoid statins if possible. It may not be possible, but if it's possible, you can avoid those, which is helpful. You don't want to drive their cholesterol down too low. You want to increase their nitric oxide, which you can do with things like beetroot or Neo40. There are all sorts of ways to do that. Um, this is, again, where this EWAT is very helpful. There may be a role for, in these people for ginkgo. Beware of amyloid angiopathy, as I mentioned. You can do an MRI and specifically look for microsequence. There's a thing called MP-RAGE. If you simply order a microbleed sequence on MRI, it'll tell you whether there are these little microbleeds that are often a tip-off that someone has this amyloid angiopathy. Type 5, traumatic. This is a little bit like type 2. You don't have the support for that network, and so you want to enhance that support. You want to reduce their phosphotal, which you can do with nicotinamide. You want to remember these people need to generate synaps synapses, so citicoline, DHA, and in some cases, uh, even stem cells can be helpful. Brain training can be helpful. Um, and then um, my suspicion is the things we've heard about today maybe turn out to be very helpful. So obviously, avoiding even mild head trauma. OK, so the, the time's getting late here. So I think I'm going to stop there um, so I can take some questions. Uh, and um, thank you again for, uh, for everything and for the invitation.